what we were once taught was an elevator pitch. First and foremost, nobody wants to be pitched. People love to buy and hate to be sold. And secondly, it's not about having a pitch. It's about having a conversation, engaging in a dialogue. Without further ado, going to tonight's special guest. He's a guest, but he's also a very dear friend. And it's none other than the CEO of the Covenant Group, Norm Trainer. Thank you so much, and welcome back to 77 WABC. Thank you, Yitzhak. Great to be with you, my friend. Uh, thank you for inviting me. 100%. Each time we have you on... You have such great insights. We've had a show in the past that talked about building replicable po- processes to, to implement systems and processes. We've talked about uh, a, a variety of issues, um, t- taking a business that is a family business and how to you know move it along to the next generation. We've had uh, a number, and all those episodes are available by going to mybradio.com. For tonight's edition... We have a very, in fact, we're going to go to the actual, the actual name of it, and that is Players, Producers, and Pretenders in the Workplace. So, <laughs> a rather, uh, it, it's a very intriguing topic over here, you know, Players, Producers, and Pretenders in the Workplace. So, with that, Norm, I open to you and I ask as follows, you know, how would you describe each of these um, pl- players, if you will, but the, you know e- each of these uh, types, and um, you know, and and feel free to give even examples of how they are in the workforce, and of course, guidance on how to interact with each of these type of individuals. Be glad to, Yitzhak. But first of all, let me just take a moment to set context. Uh, in in our work, we identify the best practices that differentiate high performers from average producers. When you ask a high performer what makes them effective, they will readily tell you. However, when you observe what makes them so successful, it is usually not what they tell you. (laughs) High performers tend to focus on their product technical knowledge, their influence or or selling skills, Mm -hmm. uh, or personal charisma the quality and depth of their network and their ability to, to, to build strong relationships. All of those are important. That is not what differentiates players from producers and pretenders. The single most important differentiator between high performers and average producers is the time frame or time span within which they think and work or plan and work. In other words, high performers plan their work and work their plan very differently than average producers. And that relates to the longest task in which they're involved, which could be building a sustainable and scalable business, or even a a full and productive life, and the way in which they manage short, complex tasks. So specifically, uh, to answer your question, What differentiates players, producers, and pretenders? Players have a vision of what they're looking to create, and they shape the environment to realize that vision. When you ask a player what it is they're looking to achieve, they will typically describe what they want to accomplish over the next one, three, five, 10, 20 years or more. They're looking at not what they are going to achieve transactionally in the next day or week or month, but what they're going to to realize strategically over time. They also differentiate themselves by the, the thought and effort they put into what they do daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. They are opportunity providers. Producers are opportunistically driven. They chase new products, new markets, new services, new ideas. The challenge for producers is they can be effective. However, what they're looking to achieve can be easily disrupted by changes in the environment or by a loss of focus on their own part. Pretenders have not yet recognized that maturing 
is learning to live without illusions. They live in a web of self-deceit. And the cost to them and the people around them is enormous. I want to uh, draw on two examples sure. of players that I think that probably all of our audience can relate to. Sure. The, the first is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett turned 90 last week and uh, is arguably probably the greatest investor uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, and what was interesting is that, that uh, Warren Buffett has learned not only to thrive in business, but also in life. And, and uh, that's exhibited by the, the people with whom he surrounded himself and what people say about him. And recently Warren Buffett was asked to what did he attribute his success? And, and he said, first and foremost, choose work that you love, that you're passionate about, because it, it gives you a reason to, to be fully engaged uh, at each and every day. The second is surround you yourself with people you care about and who are better than you. The third and one of my favorite is laugh a lot. <laughs> one of my goals each day, Chuck, is to have 16 hearty laughs a day. So one of the things I enjoy about being with you is you make me laugh. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey, what, and, what, what number are you up to today? <laughs> 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 well, I'm, 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 I'm a good way along, so I hope to okay. be further along. All uh, right, we'll try to get some end. other laughs in right by the end of this interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, the fourth is that he said, uh, wake up every morning uh, grateful for the day ahead and, and finding ways to enjoy it. Those are great, uh, great uh, pieces of advice uh, for every aspect of our lives, yeah. business and 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 uh, and and and, and, prof and personal, uh, but the other person I'd like to 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 quote is Jeff Bezos. And uh, when Jeff Bezos' uh, wealth, personal wealth, reached 163 billion, he was interviewed in the Wall Street Journal, and he was asked to what did he attribute his success, and he cited a couple of things that I felt really stood out. The first of which was everything starts small. He said, when we started Amazon in 1994, there were just a small number of people and look what they created. And the second thing he said is, I have three priorities that inform what I do each and every day. And, and they are the guides to how I, I invest my time and my energy. And I think that what that highlights is that players not only have a future vision and shape the environment to realize it, but also bring a very clear and intense focus to what they're go going to do in their work and in their life every day to thrive. That's a key differentiator. So would you say that players are far more strategic, producers, uh, uh, producers are far more technical. Is that a fair way of breaking that out? Well, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it, it, it is uh, in part. So uh, players are strategic in that they're thinking about where they want to take their business over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years or more. Mm -hmm. I, I think, though, that that it it is perhaps an oversimplification to say that players are strategic and producers are tactical. Okay. The tactical aspects of what players do is driven by their strategic focus. With producers, the tactical aspects of what they do are determined by where they see the opportunity in front of them today, this week, this month, this quarter. So it's a very different perspective if you're looking out 5, 10, 15, 20 years than one week, uh, one month, three months, one year. That's a fundamental differentiation. Here's an interesting question. When a company is looking to hire a very key position within a company, a CEO, a CMO, et cetera, a C-level executive, uh, is there any type of, of 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 tool or way 
that the company can ascertain if they're looking at a player versus a producer or even a pretender? That, that is a, a very, uh, very good question. Um, uh, let, let me answer it this way. Uh, when, when I engage in, in dialogue or conversations with people, what I attempt to do is to listen at two levels. I try to listen for what people are saying. And then the second level is to listen for the logic that underlies what they're saying. And that's listening at right angles. It's listening uh, very, very differently. <clears throat> now, so one aspect of that is that, that, that people treat facts as factors, but make decisions based on feelings. All decisions are emotionally based. And often when we engage in a dialogue with people and they say something that we don't agree with or that is counter to our beliefs or our philosophy of life, we react emotionally. And that's quite a natural human uh, response. The challenge is it gets in the way of understanding uh, because what often uh, intervenes is our own biases, our own uh, emotions, uh, our own judgments. And, uh, and, and that can lead uh, to a, a not very positive outcome. When you're listening at right angles, you're not listening for whether you agree or disagree with their point of view. You're really attempting to understand what is the rationale or the logic? Does the logic make sense? Now, when you're, when you're having a conversation and you're looking at, at the differentiation between players and producers and pretenders, typically, in terms of listening at right angles, players will talk in terms of models. The producers will talk in terms of methods. And pretenders will talk in terms of rationales. And so let me give you an example. Sure. When, when you ask a player uh, what um, they're trying to achieve in their business or in their life, what they will often give you is a conceptual frame. They'll describe what they want their business to become in terms of its viability, mm -hmm. uh, return on equity, growth and shareholder value over the next three, five, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Producers will talk about what they're doing, what, what their methods are. In other words, players focus often on the goals they're looking to achieve over time, typically extended five, 10, 20 years. Producers talk about procedurally how they're going to go about uh, getting what they want. And pretenders often give you the rationale for why they haven't achieved the success they wanted in life. Or in, or in business, um, uh, and, and often that's externalizing. It's not what they're in control of, it's that they're at the effect of their environment. And so when, when I'm interviewing someone, uh, one of the red flags is if they start telling me that, that all the things that have gone wrong in their life were someone else's fault or a function of circumstance, whether that's true or not, right. players take responsibility for, for, for what they achieve, their successes and their failures. Producers uh, do as well, and pretenders tend to default to it. it it's a function of circumstance or someone else's uh, fault. Does that help? Absolutely. Absolutely. The first segment in tonight's episode focused on players, producers, and pretenders in the workplace. In case you missed it, you could listen to the archives because now we're going to move to a different part, a different area of material that Norm would like to discuss. And that is, okay, in the, in, in, as part of the content that is shared with the participants at the Covenant Group, he has a way to describe five ways in which players achieve and sustain peak performance. I'm going to spell them out. Mindset, target, engage, 
commit and expand. Norm, I'm going to leave it to you, the big task here, to really uh, explain each of these five categories and why they're so important to be mindful of them in a business setting. Thank you, Isha. It, it all starts with our mindset. I'll get into that in more detail. The way we act is typically shaped by the way we think. Target, the narrower your focus, the bigger your opportunity. High performers have a clear sense of what they're looking to achieve. Engage, the way in which they enter into a relationship, for example, sets the stage for everything that follows. In other words, if you know how to open, if you're in sales, you don't have to close. High-performing salespeople, high performing salespeople, for example, really manage that initial interaction. Commit, how you take people through the, 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 the process of buy-in, whether it's the sale of a product or service or gaining commitment to uh, an organizational goal or a, a, a personal uh, commitment uh, in a relationship. And finally, expand. The natural result of relationships is toward erosion of sensitivity and inattentiveness. In other words, if you want to grow relationships, you have to work at them. And high performers have a strategy for growing relationships and, and growing in their work and in their life. So if we look at these five areas, mindset, target, engage, commit, and expand, the challenge in each of them is to move from familiarity to mastery. So one of the things that you will find when I'm describing each of these is the tendency to say, I know that. And much of it is just common sense. The key is not what you know, it's what you do with what you know. And with high performers, they manage the, 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 the process in a different way. So one of the examples is an advisor whom I've had the, the privilege of coaching for the last six years. He's a very successful financial advisor, lives in the Midwest, has a home in, in Indiana and a home in Florida. His name is Dean Harder. And we first started working together when Dean was, was 48. And Dean exemplifies three characteristics that, that, that players exhibit in, uh, in their work and in their life. The first is recognition. They are self-aware, they have self-insight. And as a result, they are very effective at self-management. They bring focus and discipline to what they do. The second is resilience. They've learned that they can overcome adversity, that in fact, adversity often leads to greater strengths, that in business, it's natural to fail. It's how you deal with that that differentiates you. And finally, routines. They bring discipline to what they do in their work and in their life. But one of the other characteristics of high performers in terms of mindset is that they address three questions that are critical to success in our work. The first is, what role do you want to play? In, in our work, Yitchak, typically, we will find ourselves in, in one of four categories. Those who find the work hard to learn and hard to do. Those who find it uh, uh, easy to learn but hard to do. Those who find it hard to learn and easy to do. And those who find it easy to do and don't remember learning it. The fourth is talent. And the key to successful job placement is to find where your natural talents lie. Players figure out what they are really good at and then surround themselves with other people who are equally capable in areas where they are not strong. They optimize their capability. So the first question is, what role do I want to play? And what role will be driven by what you're capable of doing and what you're motivated to do? The second question is, how big do I want to become? All of us want to push as big a rock as we're capable of moving. That may be measured in six figures, seven figures, eight figures, nine figures, 10 figures. It's really a personal decision. And the third is, based upon our answer to those first two questions, what is the required organization? What do we require in terms of capabilities and resources to achieve what's important in our work and our life? 
So let's take Dean, for example. Mm-hmm. When we first started working together, Dean lived in Indiana with his wife, Jackie. And his vision was that as his children were going off to college and, 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 and leaving the nest, he and Jackie had a desire to have a home in Florida. And he wanted to design his business and his life to spend the first three to four months in, in Florida and then go back and forth between Indiana and Florida, but keep his business very active and, and very involved. And over the last six years, he's been able to realize that. He spends a, a period of time, typically the, the good weather or the bad weather months in Indiana, the good weather months in Florida, uh, living there and then and back in Indiana, closer to their, their three children and, and grandchildren. And uh, that has worked out very well for him. But one of the telling uh, lessons in terms of what Dean did was he designed his business to work remotely. And so he moved everything online to his interactions with clients when he was in Florida could continue uninterrupted. It wasn't a question of physical proximity. So when uh, COVID-19 hit, Dean didn't skip a beat. In fact, year to date, his business is up over 30%. Wow. And that's what players do. They design their business and their life in such a way that they're not impacted in the same manner. So fundamentally, that's what distinguishes uh, high performers in terms of mindset. Tonight's show on the 77 WABC is a title where we're actually covering two different distinct areas. The first part of tonight's program discussed players, producers, and pretenders. Uh, We're not going to go back to that in tonight's show because that will be available on the archives. Now we're discussing the five ways in which players achieve and sustain peak performance. One is mindset. Number two is target, three is engage, four is commit, five is expand. We spoke about mindset. When we come back after the break, we are going to discuss target, engage, commit, and expand. But before we go to the break, Norm, how can people find out more about your amazing program, which I'll admit here, I drink the Kool-Aid. I am part of Norm's program. I am honored to be part of it and have gained immensely. Norm, how can people find out more about the program? Our website is www.covenantgroup.com. We also have another website, www.mybusinessbuilderacademy.com. If you go to that website, there are case studies, videos, one of my books in a digital format that you can download for free. You can learn about what we do from people like Dean Harder, who've experienced it firsthand. We were discussing about the five ways that players achieve and sustain peak performance, mindset, target, engage, commit, and expand. In the last segment, we, we uh, spent time discussing the mindset. Perhaps now you can move on and discuss target and engage. One of the characteristics of high performers is they bring focus and discipline to what they do. And one of the ways in which you can achieve that is that the narrower your focus the bigger your opportunity. In other words, you have a clear target that you set out for yourself. Uh, I'm Dean sorry Harms- to interrupt. I, that, that, that is so insightful because one would think, right, you know, okay, let me keep that wide open area and I'll just accomplish the world. You're saying, no, be focused, be super focused. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's, it, it's so, such important advice. It's a critical learning because that's how you differentiate yourself. So Dean Harder is a good example. Dean's been a financial advisor for over 23 years. Dean's 54 years of age. He's passionate about helping people achieve financial security and independence in retirement, no matter what. There are three questions every business has to get right, Yachuk. Who is the right client? What is the right value proposition? The clarity of your value proposition drives everything. And what is the right exchange of value? Starting with what's the benefit to the client and what do you receive in return? So with Dean, he works with people primarily who uh, have a a W-2 tax return. They're executives, white collar people in business. He does have some business owners and and, uh, professionals who 
fill out a 1099, but the vast majority of his people would be working within organizations. And when he meets somebody, one of the first questions Dean asks is, are you planning to retire someday? And if they say yes, then, uh, and, and they're in that five to 10 to 15 years from retirement, they're an ideal client for him. And his value proposition, it, I'll get into in a moment, is really helping them retire financially secure. And the quid pro quo is that when he helps them achieve what's important to them, in turn, he builds a successful advisory practice. But one of the things that distinguishes Dean is that often advisors measure their success based upon transaction value, the commissions they earn or the fees from working with clients. That's not how Dean measures success. He's focused on the lifetime value of the client relationship how he can grow with his clients over time and over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, help them realize what's important in their lives, retiring financially secure. And in turn, that will enable Dean someday to retire financially secure. That's what Target is all about. So now we move to Engage. Yes, sir. So one of the things that we tell or teach salespeople is that if you know how to open you don't have to close. In other words, the way you handle that initial interaction with a prospect of client is critical. We talked about earlier that people are judgmental by nature. We tend to form an impression of someone within the first one to three minutes of meeting them. And the way you manage that interaction is critical. So what differentiates high performers is the way they manage the before, the during, and the after. So let's take sales for an example. One of the things that we know from research is that when people make a decision to buy, they triangulate. In other words, they will look for three or more sources to validate their decision to make a purchase. That can be a a small item. It can be something very, very expensive. And, And typically today, people will ask someone they know So if Dean is uh, meeting a prospect of client, usually he's been introduced to that prospect of client by an existing client. The best form of marketing is word of mouth. They speak very highly of Dean. But what will also happen is the the um, the client uh, or the prospect of client will Google Dean and Dean's put a lot of time, effort and money into managing his online presence. So you know that uh, one of the people you're going to be interviewing is Deborah Jasper of Mindset Digital. Deborah is one of the Absolutely. foremost communication experts in North America on how to build up your digital presence, your thought leadership online. And, and Dean, in, in one of the many investments he's made in building his business, utilizes Deborah. So he manages those two parts of triangulation so that when he meets them for the first time, they are already favorably disposed. And then what we get into is how you handle that initial interaction. There's two principles of selling. The first is focus on the other person, make them the center of the experience. And the second is you earn the right to proceed. Buying is a series of micro decisions and you move people through a series of decision points. So when Dean meets someone for the first time, and let's say that they've been introduced to him And they will say, Dean, tell me what you do. And he'll say, Yichok, I'd be glad to, but first, would you mind if I asked you a question? Are you planning to retire someday? Because not everybody is. I'm not planning to retire. (laughs) You're going strong. You're going strong, Norm. (laughs) Yeah, if they're not planning to retire, then Dean will move to another tack. But if they say yes, then Dean will say, well, tell me, what does your retirement dream look like? And then when they come back and say, so Dean, what do you do? Again, you'll say, thank you for asking. You always acknowledge the other person. And then you communicate your passion. And, And Dean does it by saying, I love helping people. I love helping people like you move from the majority to the minority. Only a small number of people will retire financially secure and able to live their retirement dream. I'd love to show you how this works. And... Generally speaking, nine out of 10 people would say, tell me more. So there's two principles when you engage with someone for the first time. Principle number one is 
you utilize, you, you want to earn permission to move forward. And mm-hmm. the way you earn permission is by focusing on what's important to them. What are their goals? What are their aspirations? And Dean's a master of that. Makes sense? Absolutely makes sense. And and again, we're focusing now on engage. Uh, perhaps even before we go to a break, just to spend a little bit more time because, I mean, that's 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 the magic of mankind. You know, it, it, like like you discussed earlier in the show, we we make decisions based on emotions. Engaging is 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 at is at the core of all that. You're absolutely right, and that's a key point, uh, you Chuck. So. What we were once taught was an elevator pitch. First and foremost, nobody wants to be pitched. People love to buy and hate to be sold. And secondly, it's not about having a pitch. It's about having a conversation, engaging in a dialogue. So the structure we use for the client attraction conversation is you, me, us, we. And I just illustrated it with Dean. The you is focus on the other person, ask questions and listen. The me is your transition statement. When they say, what do you do? Thank you for asking. I love helping people. I love helping people like yourself, five to 10 years from retirement, move the majority of the minority. The, the, the we is you share a story of someone in a situation similar to theirs and, and how they retired financially secure and independent. And the us is your statement of intent. If we could do that for you, would that be a basis for us to work together? And, like and now you, you're and like- into the, the commit stage. And it's like you said, if you know how to open, you don't have to close. <laughs> it's so yeah. important to have that at the opener. Um, mm-hmm. Now we're going to discuss commit and expand. With that, I turn it over to Mr. Norm Trainer. Thank you, sir. As I mentioned earlier, buying is a series of micro decisions. Whether you're trying to get someone to buy into an idea, a product, or a service. And the way in which we manage each of those decision points is critical to achieving success and, and, and getting to where we want to be and more importantly, where that other person wants to be. So once we engage in a client attraction conversation, the next phase is the discovery. Two principles of selling or influence, focus on the other person, earn the right to proceed. And in the discovery, what we're really looking to identify is what's important to them? What are they looking to achieve? One of the ways in which players differentiate themselves is they focus on the other person's goals. What are they looking to achieve? And they focus on commonality of interest. There are three elements to commonality of interest. First is, what are the results the other person wants to achieve? And how do they fit with the outcomes or outputs you're looking to accomplish? The second is, what's the process? The the methods are how we do it. And, And we let the other person be the guide. We earn the right to proceed. And the third is the emotional or psychological. What's going on for the person emotionally? So players really focus on getting a buy-in from the other person. They're not looking to sell, they're looking to obtain a buy-in. When they present their, their proposal or their solution, they first focus on what's the loss to which people are currently exposed in their present situation. People are first motivated to avoid loss. So you have to describe for people the consequences if they keep doing what they're doing versus what you're proposing. Then you present your solution, what it is and how it works. And then you illustrate through stories, analogies and metaphors how you've helped people like them achieve what's important in their lives. You have to get that emotional buy-in and then you obtain commitment. And like anything, if you know how to open, you don't have to close. If you've built agreement throughout, the decision to buy or to move forward is a natural and logical consequence. And then we're moving into follow-up and implementation. And that's where we move into the expand part of uh, this cycle. The natural result of relationships is toward erosion of sensitivity and inattention. In other words, if, if we want a relationship to grow, we have to work at it. So once someone becomes a client or once someone buys in to what you're proposing as a leader, an executive, a manager, now what's critical is what you do after the sale or after the buy-in. And in this case, 
One of the ways in which players differentiate themselves is by doing common things uncommonly well. Isidore Sharp, the legendary founder of the Four Seasons, when asked how is it Four Seasons can charge twice the room rate of Hilton, Sheraton or Weston, answered, it is because we do common things uncommonly well. Players do common things uncommonly well. And I'll give you an example. One, I mentioned that, that Dean Harder has built his business to thrive not only in business, but also in life. So he and his wife, Jackie, have a beautiful home in Florida. They have a beautiful home in in the Midwest. And they're back and forth between the two. And Dean can operate seamlessly no matter where he is because he's moved everything online. And one of the processes we teach is that you engage in a periodic review process with your clients. And a periodic review is basically a check-in to look at how they're doing towards the accomplishment of their goals and what needs to be addressed in order to move them forward. It's aligning strategies and tactics, planning and execution. And, and we teach a six step process for conducting periodic reviews. Dean is only involved in one of those steps. His very capable assistant, Jane, handles the other five. So Jane and, and Dean determine with whom Dean's going to have a, a periodic review each month. And he typically does 15 periodic views a month with clients, with individual clients. Uh, Jane will send out an email or letter inviting the client to a periodic review and scheduling it when it's convenient for them. She'll call to schedule it. 10 days before the meeting, she'll send out an agenda. The agenda has seven items on it. Two days before the meeting, she'll call not, not only to confirm the meeting, but also to review the agenda because there's three parts of that agenda that that Dean wants to understand before the meeting. The first uh, point on the agenda is, what would you like to discuss in your meeting with Dean? And the second is, have there been any changes in your situation? Because people tend to make financial decisions based on trigger events, getting married, having a baby, buying a house, starting a business, uh, getting an inheritance, all of those things. So Dean wants to be armed with that information. And then the, 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 the third thing she does in advance is she engages the client in a survey to determine how happy or engaged the client is with the work they do. So one of the first questions she asks is, you talk on a scale of one to five, one being poor, two average, three good, four very good, and, and five excellent, how would you rate the quality of our service. Now, what are you looking for if you want to do common things uncommonly well? Yeah, well, of course, you're looking for number five. Yeah, of course. But that that's that's so important because then all, yeah, if, if there's a challenge, if there's an issue, then get, you know, you don't want to get broadsided during a phone call on such, uh, on such a matter. Exactly. So, uh, Jane asks those questions and, and conducts that survey because Dean is focused on creating client capital. Client capital is the most important measure of success in your business, yet it appears nowhere on your balance sheet or income statement. Client capital is the sum of three elements, the depth of relationship you have with your clients. Do do your clients view you as their trusted advisors? They turn to you for advice or counsel, in Dean's case, with regard to their financial affairs. The second is the breadth of relationship. Are your clients willing to introduce recommended people and refer people in their social circle? Uh, the, the extent to which they become your evangelists. And the third is, how engaged are they with you? How committed are they to the relationship? We're all fallible human beings. People make mistakes. It's not about your client always being satisfied because sometimes we'll do things that dissatisfy people, not intentionally. It's how engaged they are. And, and so Dean works at depth of relationship, breadth of relationship, and degree of engagement. And so that in that interview, Dean goes with that arm, that armed with that information about what's top of mind for the client, how engaged are they? And the periodic review process is really designed to increase that engagement. If you want relationships to grow, you have to work at it. And then this, the, the, the final step in the sixth step periodic review process is follow up 
what the action steps are and making sure that you do what you say you're going to do. Four things that more than anything else establish credibility over time. Be on time. Do what you say you're going to do. Finish what you start and acknowledge others. Say please and thank you. Those are the five phases. Mindset, target, engage, commit, and expand. Norm, the most difficult part of doing a show with you is as we barrel into the close, like there's still so many questions I want to ask, but we'll have to save it for another opportunity when we're doing a show together. (laughs) Roughly in the 60 seconds we have left, what final takeaway could you please share with the listeners here of Mind Your Business? Well, I I want to go back to um, what... um, Uh, Jeff Bezos said, everything starts small. Become clear about what you're looking to achieve in your work and in your life. And then think about what you can do today and tomorrow to bring that about. And in order to bring focus and discipline, identify three results you want to achieve in the next three months to a year. And the three activities that will contribute the most to achieving those results. Write them down and use those as your guidelines each day in in leading a fuller and more productive life. Those are the two key takeaways I would recommend. I love the honor of interviewing C-level executives and sharing their great advice and perspective on Mind Your Business. I'd love to get your feedback. Post it in the comments below and subscribe You'll never miss an edition of Mind Your Business.